Before we get started, please remember to like or subscribe to this video or podcast. It really helps others to find Cleaning Up. Cleaning Up is brought to you by Liebreich Foundation and Giladini Foundation. Hello, my name is Michael Liebreich and this is Cleaning Up. My guest today is Nao Koishi. For eight years until 2020, she was CEO and chair of the Global Environment Facility of the UN. She is now a professor and the inaugural director of the Center for the Global Commons at the University of Tokyo. Please welcome to Cleaning Up, Naoko Ishii. So Naoko, welcome to Cleaning Up. Thank you. Tell me, um, during this terrible pandemic, uh, where have you been and, and how, has it, how has it been? How have, you, how have you spent your time? Actually, I did make my physical move. <laughs> Uh, from Washington DC, where I served for the, uh, the GEF and Global Environment Facility for eight years in Washington, to actually back to Tokyo, Japan. So it's really the physical and of course that's a professional move, but I ran a lot during that uh, phase uh, because then how the lockdown works in Washington DC and how it works in Japan is uh, actually the totally, totally different. Culture is different and the government behavior is different. Actually the citizens acceptance is different. So it's, it's really an uh, interesting and, uh, experience. And now uh, since last uh, August, I have been in Tokyo and working for, uh, for university. And this is also another very different place. I've never been at academic and, uh, uh, the space and uh, the first time in my 40 years of working <laughs> experience now I am with academics. And that is different. <laughs> so that's been a, a pretty big uh, year or, or 18 months for you. Um, yeah. Let's come back to your, your role in academia, your current your role as a professor in the uh, University mm -hmm. of Tokyo. Uh, but let's go back to the Global Environment Facility, because mm -hmm. um, just to fill you in, our audience are generally quite knowledgeable about net zero and the transition and clean energy and climate and maybe even about the workings of the UN but I'll bet you that there's a lot of them that don't know about the global environment facility so perhaps we should start there and you explain uh, what it is because you led it for eight full years. Yes yeah yeah thank you actually the global environment facility or GEF was established in 1991 just the eve of uh, Rio first uh, the Earth Summit at, at Rio, and uh, it was in 1992. And that is a time when that the Climate Change uh, Convention, Biodiversity Convention, a little later that the Desertification Convention were, were reached. So that the GEF was created to help uh, developing countries to meet the, the obligation uh, coming out of those three conventions. So, and uh, it was already uh, almost 30 years in, in operation. And my role as a CEO is, is basically to raise funds from donor countries, and that's about 1 billion per year, and come up with a program, distribute it along the program uh, to that uh, actually 150 developing countries and to monitor it and report it to the board and to, uh, um, to, to basically make sure that uh, those um, three conventions plus also other conventions are kind of met. However, for the last uh, actually 30 years, not only my eight years, it become apparently clear that uh, those mechanisms actually didn't work. <laughs> you, you can see what happened in the climate change. Every year we get the uh, 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 hot, 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 hot and hot and hot year. And in terms of biodiversity, we are losing the biodiversity at an unprecedented rate. And of course, the desertification is ongoing. So we are basically uh, not able to stop uh, this environmental, global environmental crisis in any way. So that is my <laughs> eight years. And yeah, but that's where we met, actually. Yeah. Well, that's a pretty stark picture that you paint there, because um, mm -hmm. I would suggest that you had a very successful eight years. Um, <laughs> but what you're saying is, no, completely failed. We 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 failed to, uh, you know, we, we failed to stop the the rot on the, mm -hmm. on all of these issues, um, and therefore that your time 
you're you're sort of saying that you feel like the, you failed in your in your eight years. I, I think you're being a little harsh on yourself now. I mean, you, your eight years were 2012 through to 2020. So 20, yeah. you saw you. I mean, on the climate front, you saw um, Copenhagen, and then you saw Paris, and then you saw right the way through till uh, um, near not not quite to uh, Glasgow yeah. 20, COP 2026, but you, but you know past Paris, you saw the impact that that was having with all these net zero pledges. So uh, you know, are you being fair by saying that it's just a complete failure? I'm not necessarily saying I am or GF is failing. I'm saying this entire system is failing, system. or mechanics is failing, and that may be that much fairer or a uh, more objective point. And thank you, Michael, uh, for kind of recognizing my eight years. And actually, I did my really best to try to transform this small institution, GEF, to be um, to up to their expectation. So actually, the GEF in its operation of the 30 years is really doing a lot of things that then, but when I, I assumed that job in 2012, maybe we already have an um, 1,000 or 2,000 projects and the 10 billion that then, uh, are distributed from US dollars and then a lot of good then, uh, experience here and there. But that the first question I did ask when I landed at the GEF is all of those thousands of projects really to catalyze the system change which we, 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 we need. And the answer is unfortunately not exactly because every project has its own good thing, but we are not really able to bring those small projects which are kind of fragmented in all over the world, in all over the sector towards one systemic change. Um, either to the decarbonization of the energy system or to transform the food system or to change the design of the cities. So, so that, that a lot of good, uh, reasonably successful projects all over the world, but not really able to bring them together as a catalyst for that change. And that was what I'm trying to do for eight years to really work with um, uh, the people like you that are like and a stakeholders, significant influential stakeholders to find a way that how this small pot of money of the GF to, to, to catalyze a much bigger system change. Then what we need to do, and what I think I tried, is to come up with a more like a coalition among the, the, the stakeholders, it's not only the government or environmental ministries, but much broader ministries in the, the government side, but also the local government, because a lot of decisions are actually taken at the local level, particularly at the city space, and also the private sector. The private sector, at the end of the day, really make a lot of decisions, that the investment decisions, the production consumption decisions, then citizens. So how we can create that kind of multi-stakeholder platform? That's something I have, I have been doing for eight years. And on that front, yeah, if I may say, I think I did my best. I transform the GIF a little bit, but then uh, if we just then uh, be very objective by numbers, <laughs> we were not really able to stop that then, uh, climate change or biodiversity loss. And that is the challenge, not just the GEF, but its entire intergovernmental UN and also MDBs, the Bretton Woods system, how we can really transform those intergovernmental system to arrest those uh, non global environmental challenges. Right, so it's a tremendous vision to go from essentially individual grants to being a catalyst uh, yeah. sitting at the center of the financial system. Let's just go take one step back, though, and uh, look at the mechanics of the GEF. How does it actually work? Um, because you have these kind of four year, you had two four year periods where you have to go and raise money and then you apply money, but it's in a very specific way working with the, um, the host countries of the various projects. And I'm very aware of these four year cycles because, um, you know, you used to sort of appear and be, you know, in, talking in the same conferences and, and talking to the same people and you were clearly in fundraising mode. And then after that, you would sort of disappear for a few years, I suspect doing your proper job, which was putting the money to work and actually uh, doing the work of the Global Environment Facility. So talk to us about that sort of four year cycle and how do you work with the host countries? 
Yeah, no, actually, you have such a very precise observation and smart observation. Yes, it's a four year cycle. And during this fundraising mode, what we, we do is to come up with a strategy and consult with the government and to check that if it is kind of acceptable or not acceptable, then we go for fundraising. So this takes about actually the two years <laughs> from beginning to end. Then that, as you said, after two years, and then once we get the money and then everything is agreed, we go for the operations. <laughs> but of course, even during the fundraising time, that the operation is ongoing because project will not stop. But then my appearance is more like a capital city, so the fundraising that the source of fund to us that then actually that the villages to the operation of develop, developing countries. So there is quite a change of my own um, kind of a physical appearance. But what will happen is, yeah. And the amount, just to get an idea of the quantum, you said it's about a billion dollars per year that is being yes. that's being dispensed. Yeah. And so this is then this is being um, collected, is being put together from the various donor nations, and then you get a, a, a then you 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 close the fundraising with four or five billion, and then you have a few years to put that to work. And of course, nothing just exactly. stops. Uh, you know that that right. funding goes continues throughout the cycle, but then you have to go out and and, and look for another to replenish the funds. Correct. That is absolutely correct. Um, and actually, this uh, that the fundraising is not just the fundraising. This is really that the uh, uh, very serious consultation about what we the GF thinks that then we should do or they should do, and then from their side, what they expect us to do, and right. also what they think themselves have to do. So it's really that process of. Um, exchange the opinions at the uh, deep consultation, sometimes the very uh, heated discussion and come up with a kind of agreed project or the program. What I really did for the last eight years is to, to shift from individual other uh, projects to a much more systematic uh, holistic program. So uh, for, for instance, that uh, so we call it from individual project to as much a holistic program mode. Uh, the last four year cycle, what I really did is that the three major program, one is the food system, how to transform the food system. Then the second one is how to transform the cities, not uh, the, the central government, but then how to transform the city space. That's the second one. The third one is how we can kind of come up with a better vision about the big biomes like on the Amazon or Congo Basin. And all of them really need a multi-stakeholder approach we just spoke. Um, so that is a significant change uh, from much more um, individual, fragmented, the small scale, the project which are usually agreed with Ministry of, of Environment to us, coalition. Uh, to, to fix the private sector is, is actually the central. Okay, but, and then, but that's quite challenging because all of your grants, all of the actual funds that flow have to be requested by a, a recipient country. So you can be as, as, as deterministic, as pro programmatic as you want, but you have to also persuade the recipient countries. Is that not right? So all of your, your money is sort of divided into buckets that are available for countries, but they then have to draw it down by requesting for certain projects. Is that right? That is quite right. So that it's, it requires a lot of heated debate and discussion that then, uh, and even we introduce a bit of the incentive pot of money so that I mentioned those three big programs and we even create this incentive pot of money. And if the country apply for that, either each of three projects, they get an extra money to go for. And to me, it was revolution money because before that, that, that the money allocated to the, each of the countries more like an, uh, taken for granted or it's their right. They don't have to fight for that. So right. it's a, quite a sea change. But I, I use, I try to convince them that, that this is not really my money. This is uh, the taxpayer's money who expect that the much higher impacts from one dollar. So it's not really your money, it's global environmental citizens' money uh, who rightly expect a much higher impact. So that is the logic.
But for a lot of recipient countries, though, this is the only funding that their environment ministry might get. So they've got to do everything from rangers in national parks to remediation and cleanup of, of chemical spills to absolutely everything. And you're the only, the Global Environment Facility was, was one of the only places they could go for funding. Is that correct? That is quite correct. And that's what I have been hearing quite often from environmental minister. You are the only source of money and you are now taking this from me, kind of a statement. And then we try to be really professional about it. And sometimes we need to really understand that if they lose that pot of money and if something really bad and serious happened to their uh, protected areas, of course we do listen to them, but then if there is a kind of room for better impacts, the higher impacts and the higher um, uh, uh, the, uh, impact for, as a catalyst, we try to really convince them. And also, as you already pointed out, that this money is going more from environmental ministers, put of money to us, other ministers, like it's the urban minister or the energy minister and the transport ministers. And there is a claim that those ministers do have a lot of resources, why you need more money to them. So that, then, uh, and always I try to go back to the, uh, my, my logic that then, uh, that we really need to seek the higher the impact with this uh, grant money. And because yeah. if you look at the global environmental crisis, this is something we have to stop now. So it's really fascinating because you're, you're so much on the front line of, um, in a sense, the difficult discussions. So first of all, a billion a year sounds like a lot, but you are, I don't know how many recipient countries you had, but probably over a hundred, I'm guessing. 150. 150 countries. So it's it's a it's actually a tiny amount of money given the scale of the change that's required in the economy and in society in those countries. So you've got a tiny amount of money, and the priorities of the donors are all about systemic, large scale planetary boundaries. And the priorities of the recipient countries might be not about the environment at all, or if they are, they're probably about very local issues. And that's the space that you've been having to negotiate. That is quite right, uh, really right. And uh, uh, on the developing countries or lesbian countries side, it's more like an, uh, my, my own small but important projects, the local projects versus more like that, the, why, why you need a systemic change kind of discussion. And also on the donor side, this is also not that unified or united, and the, some progressive countries really push the systemic change transformation than the more holistic approach versus, oh, I love much more concrete projects because it's easy to get money from my Congress, <laughs> right, <laughs> or the parliament. So that, 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 let's not do the, so much comp complicated projects. Let's just focus on more traditional business as usual because it, it's also okay kind of thing. So the donor side are not really unified at all. There is a diverse view about it. Um, so. But one of the real challenges that we've got as we think about net zero, and, and obviously you were worrying about biodiversity and, and, and lots of other issues as well, not just climate and so on. But if we look at net zero, one of the real challenges is how do you expect countries like, I'm thinking of Mozambique or, or Indonesia or maybe Ecuador, you know, countries that have got very substantial natural resources um, that they want to exploit, how can we ensure that we don't sort of end up with Europe, maybe North America, Canada, Japan, South Korea doing the right thing, being all net zero, uh, but actually these other very um, substantial and rapidly growing countries uh, just exploiting their own resources as they had, have every right to do, um, but doing it in such a way that it is breaching the planetary uh, budgets and the planetary boundaries. You raise two distinctively different and important points, right? The one is more like a carbon versus natural capital dimension. That then so one is like an, uh, some developing countries in Southeast Asia sitting on coal, and then uh, why don't I exploit this coal possibility to, to develop? So that's my area. The second one that you also uh, in, incorporated into your question is natural capital versus more like an. Uh, 
carbon kind of thing. So that the, because most of the discussions so far at the political space is concentrated on uh, decarbonization or the energy sector to the, uh, transformation rather than how to do this uh, natural capital in the agriculture space on the other space. So, so I think that the, you very nicely bring those together. <laughs> so I wonder how I could then address that. Um, in, in terms of this uh, uh, much politically tricky issue of I sitting on the cheap call uh, will have another uh, opportunity, actually the right to exploit it because I'm developing countries and then uh, you that North country uh, already exploited the carbon budget, this is my time to do it. And then uh, I do understand that logic. The problem is there is only one carbon budget as a planet and we need to find a way to how to allocate that carbon budget between North and who uh, kind of used a lot versus South that who are coming and are now they're developing. So that this is really that the, now where I think that the, uh, the, the COP, the Glasgow COP and the one word really have to address it so that the yes net zero as a whole and by the reasonable time that mid, mid century, but there must be a good discussion that uh, how that carbon budget be, be allocated uh, among that the, um, developed and the developing and uh, everybody. I, I see actually the, quite a political risk of this, uh, this division of the North and South, we will really, really undermine what we are trying to do as a, as a globe, as a, as a planet. So I think this uh, political care is extremely important. We shouldn't really uh, close the eyes on that. And particularly for us Japanese, we have a lot of business and the business partners in Southeast Asia who are sitting on coal <laughs> on the gas. And so how we can really not only clean up our own land, but also how we can bring them together that the natural and the net zero, not necessarily precisely the same at the year, but then in the same direction. And what kind of international cooperation mechanism we can help actually that then provide is one thing we need to do. On your second point about natural capital, I think this is another very big uh, discussion uh, because that, uh, uh, that some of those countries and also including Africa are trying to utilize that uh, this natural capital as a foundation for the development. But at the same time, these are also the ones who do understand the value of the natural capital and how to effectively, sustainably use those natural capital. So it's really more on the, the our developed country side to find a way to price collectively, not price, maybe value collectively on those natural capital and how our production consumption system uh, put the, uh, the recognize and respect to those value of the natural capital. When I think about what we eat every day, we actually use a lot of eating, a lot of biodiversity coming from East, Southeast Asia, because that the, our, our food in Japan, that the 60% of the food is actually imported. So that, the, that through that process, through this importation, we have actually that the, we are also that the, uh, adding a lot of carbon footprint and the environmental loss and uh, throughout our diet. And it's very important for us to understand where this the uh, carbon footprint but also biodiversity, loss, the water and then uh, the land are kind of devastated throughout that uh, value chain. And it is really our duty to first understand it, find a way to uh, recognize it and transform, let's see, the food system that the, so that we can actually help them actually protect and that effectively uh, utilize the, uh, the natural capital. And, and that's a that's a great segue into perhaps talking about your current role because you're the inaugural director of the Centre Center for the Global Commons um, at, at Tokyo University. Um, so are you now are you now lecturing? Are you researching? What are you doing? Because you've gone on this journey from, as you say, individual projects to understanding that essentially you can do lots of good, but you can't really solve the problem. So we failed where you started the, our conversation and being very harsh on yourself. And now you're working on the whole system as the global commons. But how are you addressing it? How are you personally working on it? Actually, I'm very lucky enough to have a, a then the president of Tokyo University who more like a share the dream of that the university should play a role of catalyzing social change 
And the he's, by the way, that he's not an environmentalist or the economist, he's actually the physicist. A physicist, <laughs> so that uh, it's almost funny that uh, I'm more like a practitioner or economist, and the met uh, this and uh, the president of university who is physicist, but more or less think along the same way that we university should play a role of catalyzing the social change. And to catalyze the social change, university shouldn't really sit it in the campus. We have to really go outside the campus to really bring that the business people, the government people in terms of policy, and then the citizens in terms of either consumer or the investor, or, and, and, and together to create this other platform. And of course, our contribution, the university contribution should be uh, more like a uh, research or the intellectual leader, but then we are also trusted as a natural, uh, maybe authentic or neutral, neutral uh, the player to bring those different and the stakeholders together. So that the dream is big, <laughs> that the, uh, we try to come up with a bit of the, the rigorous and the academic framework. Uh, we work with Johan Rockström, as you know, that the Potsdam Institute in terms of scenario modeling, how to achieve the net zero, or actually not net zero, a sustainability within the planetary boundaries, but we also work with uh, uh, WRI Andrew Steer. Now he's changing the job, by the way, that then how to transform the system change on the ground, how to create the platform with the minority stakeholders. So, so that then, then that uh, uh, other players like an uh, SDS and the uh, UL also came in as an uh, uh, index and how to measure the progress towards the system change. So, so there are quite a number of players at the international space, and then I really uh, bring, uh, try to bring them together to come up with a more consistent holistic instrument from university point of view. But uh, another important role would be how you, we, you can utilize those uh, natural tools that are uh, mobilizing system change so that we come up with an, um, uh, some business sector and then uh, to do actually one example which we already announced it's a, it's a chemical company and the chemical is usually hard to abate sector and they are quite interested in uh, that the, what is the role of the chemical industry uh, towards the 2050 that then, um, and it's 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 not that easy to see their role uh, because it's so hard to abate but then uh, because that it's a material the basic material if they are able to achieve a lot they can have a lot of influence down the street or down the value chain. So that that is actually one project or program we have just established. So it's just one example that then how we can utilize those academic and research to mobilize the social change. So it's very interesting because I have described what we're seeing emerging through the Paris Agreement, through all the net zero, mm -hmm. sustainable finance. Um, we're seeing central banks um, the, the network for greening of the financial sector. Um, we're seeing the emergence of what I've called the kind of Bretton Woods for the planet. You know, it's a, a whole set of institutions. And of course, you know, you, you started your career at the IMF and then the World Bank and the Global Environment Facility. So you're very familiar with the old Bretton Woods. Do you agree that that's kind of, or is that, is that how you sort of see it, that you now have got within the university environment, the opportunity to kind of help develop the new Bretton Woods? Yeah, I hope they are quick enough to catch up with the reality. <laughs> it's actually really good to see that the our central banks are also changing their view or attitude of the principle from all central bank is neutral climate change is nothing about them to us that they are responsible for system change uh, because that then uh, actually that the financial system stability because of the risks and that then uh, they are also going a little bit ahead of that they try to see that the opportunity side of a uh, financial sector leading the uh, systemic change so i welcome it but of course there is a lot of struggle <laughs> um and uh, in fact uh, uh, so, so I agree with your um, um, uh, observation, and I, I support it. I, I embrace it. But the reason I I established this uh, center for global commons is that then um, I, I see some kind of limitation of this intergovernmental system. That uh, because it's more like an, uh, 
government and the government, national government, not necessarily even local government, and then make some kind of agreement and then try to do a kind of business among themselves. But as you agree, I guess that then, but we really need to see that the total system transformation, which we really bring that then everybody from business to consumers and investors, so how that this and that new Britons can really do their job <laughs> to, to bring everybody together and actually remain so busy. Right, but but I would uh, let me let me challenge you or come at you on yeah. one front, which is you've called it the center for the global commons, right? Mm -hmm. And this is very much uh, this draws on um, the terminology initially from Garrett Hardin, the tragedy of the commons, right? right? And the response always to the tragedy of the commons is well, you need supra commons, you need you need a level of regulation um, above the commons that allocates resources and keeps everybody in line and polices that. And I have an issue with that, apart from the fact that Garrett Hardin was a eugenicist and a thoroughly nasty piece of work, which everybody forgets when they talk about the global commons, everybody thinks that it was sort of some, some wonderful kumbaya moment. It wasn't. What he was actually concerned with was the global south um, pushing for more resources and, 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 uh, and that had to be stopped somehow. Um, but there is another model uh, because I um, I like the, the you know I prefer the tradition coming out of you know Eleanor Ostrom and Robert Axelrod where evolution of cooperation where there's um, you know not 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 top down governance of the commons but we think about the the ways in which everybody's interests can align. I don't want to say naturally or automatically, because I think you have to work very hard at it, but through property rights, through clarifying incentives, making sure that people understand um, uh, what they can and can't control, that you end up with you know, better outcomes and the commons get managed well. And I would argue that when you look at things like the Paris Agreement, it's much more Eleanor Ostrom than it is Garrett Hardin. That's right, Michael. Actually, that you have already described the mission of the Center for Global Commons. That, that actually, that then I, I have chosen that one, knowing that if we really don't do anything, that then the commons is subject to the tragedy, and because that's a human nature. But as you already mentioned, the you know, Ostrom really has shown us that then within the community or the local community, who really does understand, who do understand, who are the are the members of that community and they also do understand that the, uh, that trade and they do share this and the same interest if we all cooperate cooperating together that the outcome would be better off so and then that either explicitly or implicitly they come up with a rule or the social norm or the code and even they have a penalty that if somebody breaches it uh, so that then, uh, this is a local community a commons rule works and that is my cooperative rule uh, but the, the challenge is that the when that the, the, we um, our economy society has been globalized and we really don't see this connection of my own deed and the consequences um either today tomorrow or actually later actually the usually consequences is some point else so that the, we lost that kind of connection of my own deed and then and the consequences of the community. So my that that's why I named the center as a center for global commons. The objective uh, or dream is that how we can really learn or actually that the model or that the bling, something the local community come up with at the global level. And as you just said, we need a lot of work. The first we need to understand there is a consequences of my own deed at the, uh, somewhere in the global environment or somewhere else, but it will come back to us later. So that how we do understand this and the connection or, or the logic, that's one. How we can create a sense of belongings and then uh, as a local community, there is a sense of belonging. So that's why it's much easier for them to respect the rule, even with penalty or without penalty, but we really don't have this uh, penalty kind of thing. That, uh, so we, we, luckily we don't have a global government. <laughs> we have some treaties, but then we don't have global government. So the how we could come up with this uh, uh, the understanding, the logic, and also the sense of belongings and some kind of um, either explicit or implicit that 
uh, the code of conduct kind of thing. And that to me, that's why I'm so passionate about multi-stakeholder coalition is this is one way to manage the global commons and not this entirely, but sometimes it's about uh, uh, stopping the deforestation of the tropical forest. Sometimes it's more like uh, promoting the renewable energy in that space. So either along the value chain or within the sector, if you are able to find that kind of, you know, uh, this uh, community uh, who share the idea of commons, and we may be able to come up with some kind of <laughs> the global governing mechanism of the global commons. Yes, it, it's, a, it's a that's a great explanation. We keep coming back to the global commons, the commons idea. But but you mentioned something very important, which is penalties, um, and that's why I'm I, I'm very attracted to the the thinking of Robert Axelrod, the evolution of cooperation. And I'm not sure if you, if you know it, it, that really bears. If anybody out there listening has not read it, it's a fantastic um, book and a story about uh, you know just uh, uh, the um, how do you get out of prisoners' dilemmas? And if they're played repetitively. Exactly. And, exactly. and I love yeah. the simplicity of the formula. Nice, retaliatory, forgiving, and clear. And if you can get people to understand that they're in a, if they are, if there is a, a, a prisoner's dilemma, a, a global commons challenge, but if it's repeated, we're going to be playing this over decades and decades. If we can construct environments at all levels where people, where pe the game people are playing, can only be won by being nice, retaliatory, forgiving, and clear, then we kind of, you know, you and I can retire because the job will be done. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, no, go ahead. Bef before we before we conclude, um, I, I, I want to ask you about uh, one thing, which is um, you have been at the top of um, finance with World Bank and the environment, these uh, multilateral agencies, and now you're leading what, what's going to be, I think, a very influential and major new center uh, in academia at Tokyo University. Um, how does, as a, you're a woman, and when you started your career, was it always clear to you that you were going to be able to succeed at that level? Because I've been to Japan many times, and it's probably, of all the business environments I've been in, the most male dominated, I mean, I've been in the corridors of Japanese companies where the women literally are bowing to the executives as they pass and they're all men. And yet you've had this stellar career. Did you always know you were going to succeed? No, not at all. Actually, um, that's interesting. It's, to me, it's more like a day-to-day -day survival game. <laughs> and then so far, I was really young at the Ministry of Finance, which is really, really male-dominating society. To me, it's, it's, a, it's more like a survival instinct. So we never, I never really talk about gender issue. That, and I, I completely ignore the gender kind of either bias or the challenge. And then that by doing that the too long, I somehow also forgot that, the, that the, this agenda is really uh, didn't bother me um, until very recently, good or bad. It's more like an, uh, the way I survived during those in the 1980s or 90s in that in a particular uh, societal time. Um, but then when I moved on to the international space, what I actually then see the more challenge is, is not really the gender, it's my nationality. Uh, because in Japan, uh, it's really more like a hierarchical society. And then I, the top necessarily doesn't have to communicate with the bottom with a clear vision and the, 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 my expectation <laughs> and the, the, the mission of this and the, uh, the, the company or anything like that. When I move on to the, let's say, the World Bank or the GEF later, that there's a huge expectation at the senior level or the particular the CEO level to how to communicate uh, this mission and vision and the value to the, to the entire institution. And that was very, very new to me. And then in Japan, it's everything is understood. You don't have to say that in the everyday mission value and strategy. That, that is the difference. And then that, that maybe one very difficult ex, um, example for me is that then when the Black Lives Matter happened last uh, uh, spring, that then there was a high expectation at the GF 
that we should say something about Black Lives Matter. It never really came to my mind, honestly, that the, as a being Japanese, because partly because that the, um, quite I do understand how important that issue is, how deep that issue is, that somehow I felt hesitant not to speak about to speak about it, but the expectation is that that the any top leadership of that institution have to acknowledge the value of those universal value. And that's a difference mostly coming from nationality. So let me be very clear. It's not that then I do not understand it. I think I do understand very well about the value. It's more like an expectation uh, of the value statement should a CEO have to deliver it or that it's, it's naturally uh, he or she should do it, or it's something that then, um, there's not really much that kind of expectation because it's not directly related to the core mandate of the institution. So that's something that then I learned with a huge pain that then, even during my last year uh, of the CEO. And that is not about the gender, so it's more like an, a cultural issue that then, and the expectation as a leader of the institution. And from that point of view, I'm still learning a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I certainly um, think you've been a, a, you know, a tremendous ambassador uh, for your country. Um, and uh, you know, I've, been, I've, been, I've navigated that space very well in terms of your ability to communicate uh, at all levels. I, I, I didn't uh, see exactly you know, last year during that particular Black Lives Matter moment, how you dealt with it, but I'm sure that you, uh, I'm sure that you dealt with it well. Uh, and um, you know, I, I very much hope that your new role will see you continuing to play uh, on the international stage and not just uh, in Tokyo, because although I get to yeah. Tokyo and I will get to Tokyo after the pandemic, <laughs> yes. it will be infrequently. And I'd like uh, to think that we could interact on a more regular basis. I hope, are you mm -hmm. coming to COP26? Uh, if that then uh, COVID-19 allows us to do, of course, it's in your home country, right? <laughs> Well, very good. It's, so it's in Scotland, but I consider myself as British, and therefore I, it is. It That's is certainly a Saturday. On the whole event. Sorry, I um, missed it. And, <laughs> and I've got some very big plans, which I'd like to um, share with you when the time comes, and, and invite you to be involved in some things that we're doing. Uh, that so is let's wonderful. Let's hope that the pandemic uh, passes, <laughs> that the vaccinations work and mm -hmm. continue to work, uh, mm -hmm. and it will be an absolute pleasure. Uh, to see you next and to work on these issues alongside you. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Anna Michael. I really need your help on that because that one of the reasons I decided to come back to Tokyo and create the center of the global commons is that how I can bring Japan back to international sustainable community. Because during the last eight years at the GF, I have literally, or actually the very rarely heard the voices from Japan that somehow Japan is completely bypassed or missed. <laughs> so that then, uh... yeah, I think there's work to be done for sure. I think mm. that I, I see, um, I see Japan as, you know, having been a leader, particularly on climate, until Fukushima. And at that point, yeah. the kind of national need to procure energy to keep the lights on kind of knocked mm -hmm. Japan out of the first circle of nations working Maybe. on yeah. and sustainability. Yeah. yeah, so we lost 10 years, a decade. <laughs> yeah. Somehow, that then, so I'm, I'm really keen to bring okay. Japan back onto this international circuit uh, so that then I can also play a little bit of role to bridge that. And so I really need your help to do it <laughs> i'm sure you'll uh, i'm sure you'll, you'll you'll manage it and if there's anything that i can do to help i'll certainly do that thank, thank you. you thank you so much for joining us here today on cleaning up thank you so much michael it's really a pleasure to meet you again and uh, let's continue thank you Very good. See bye bye, you soon. Naoka. bye bye so that was naoko ishii professor and inaugural director of the center for the global commons at the university of tokyo and former ceo and chair of the un's Global Environment Facility. My guest next week is Sharon Burrow. She's the General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation. Please join me at this time next week for a conversation with Sharon Burrow on cleaning up. Mm -hmm.